four out of five academy players that joined us at under nine won't be playing football mm. at, at age 21. So, you know, that, these are the stats and they, they, they don't lie in this case. So it's, it's, it's about education, it's about helping them to understand either they'll be with the first team or they maybe have a career in football or they have a great experience where they use that to kickstart to do something else in society. That they're the education that starts. And then obviously, what do we do within? What people do we have that reiterate those messages? I can't do that on my own. <laughs> we have got 150 to 180 kids, you know, in our academy. I've got, we've got 80 staff full-time, part-time, we've got 120 in total. So we need to have the right people around these kids to make sure they understand what they sign up to. And obviously the staff then to have things in play, training session, workshops, deliver something that is useful for them, you know, to make sure they understand the challenges, but as well, uh, what kind of opportunities you have when you join an academy, because we have great experience to offer. We have great groups and development to offer. So um, that's why I'm excited, you know, still. It's a difficult task to be responsible for that. And sometimes um, you feel like that you give a little bit too much too early. And that is something that we are, that, I'm, that I need to be aware and cautious every single day. And I need to step up and, and be there and present and tell them about my own stories, right? I was, I was, what do, you mean up. By, what do you mean by too much too early? Um, yeah, I, I would think that obviously you want to, you want to create an identification with a brand and with Arsenal Football Club. So every year they get boots, they get kit, they get the, the newest stuff for free, basically. They've got the best pitches, grass, astro. Uh, we've got nice facilities. So that it is a little bit of a bubble, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a little bit of a fake world where once the bubble bursts, you know, the, the outside world is fenced, you know, is it, is controlled. So the outside world is different, right? Sometimes we provide taxis to take them from home to training or from school to training. That's something that doesn't exist in the real world, right? Otherwise, you know, when they when they then be released from the academy, which will happen at some stage anyway, right? They then just don't know how to take the bus. They, they are, just, are just used to taking a taxi to training. And all of a sudden there's no taxi, there's no taxi credit anymore. There is no free kit. There is no shoes that come every, every six months. So that's what I mean with um, mm -hmm. too much too early. And that is, is that earned? Probably not, but is, is our way of creating an identification, giving them certain standards that are needed in, in the academy world in England. That's part of our governing body, Premier League, EPPP rules to make sure we, we comply with that, obviously, to provide the best possible, you know, opportunities. Uh, and sometimes you, you step a little bit over the mark. When I remember my academy time, yeah, there was red clay pitches. Um, there was in, in the summer with the dust, in the in the winter with the rain, and we would probably eat that that stuff, you know. So, and that is all taken away now because it's causing cancer or whatever or, or whatever the case may be. It, so, uh, what I was telling um, is, yeah, there is this sense of a little bit of a bubble that is created that is not beneficial to everyone. So, it's our job to make sure people understand the privilege they're in ourselves first and foremost as staff and then to the players that's why we we kind of try to live our academy standards respect discipline humility as much as we can so we have a huge responsibility to role model and bring the right messages to the people parents players that they once the bubble bursts it will at one stage that they will cope you, you you say yourself in, in you know in, in your book that football was always the plan B, right? You yeah. know that's how I how I read it. So, do, do you share this idea with your young players? You know, and because because you call it a bubble, you you call it slightly unreal. And how do they react when when you know? And probably they were different. But how do you react when you basically punch holes in that bubble in, in a way? At the same time, you rebuild it all the time. 
yeah, I'm trying to normalize. I'm mm-hmm. trying. To, I'm trying to really. That's my job to normalize, to to put perspective every single day to players and and parents to normalize, to put perspective, and to be really clear. You know that there are no surprises, because eventually I don't want that if someone gets released that the burden is too heavy, right? It, it feels like the burden of uh, I need to make it. I need to make it as a footballer because. There's the glamour world, you know. There's the millions. There's the um, the sun that that pays for 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 me in the future. Whatever the case may be, you know that that cannot happen, you know. But it's difficult, you know. And I understand that. I understand kind of that role and and trying to make sure we need to work hard, you know, to make sure that everyone understands how important education is, academic education. We want to put that first. And if something is wrong in that. We need to make sure we guide the the youngsters, the parents, um, that they understand, you know, what privilege we have to educate them, that they get great experience with us, but they never forget um, what is important and how to build a foundation for themselves. Um, That is really important. It cannot only rely just on football because at some stage, and I tell you again, it can burst after a year, after two years, after an injury. For me, it bursted after 15 years of professional football, basically, right? And then I was released into the society, and here you go. And it depends how much you grew, how much you develop yourself, how much then people see you as, yeah, you can take that role for the future. It was similar to me. After seven years of, at Arsenal, Arsene Wenger, Ivan Gazidis, two of the great leaders of this football club decided we want you to take on the academy. Why did they do that? that that's the question I asked. Why, why did they ask me to do it? Because, yeah, they've seen me work for seven years and they kind of got a sense of, yeah, that could be a good academy manager. Even if he doesn't know what's going on there <laughs> right now, we trust him that he will educate himself, that he will take it serious and has has got the discipline to educate um and make this academy the best possible place for youngsters to grow and develop. So, and that's what people need to understand. Um, um, so it, it, is, it is really interesting and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this role and that people trusted me, but I want to fulfill that. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, how can I make sure I carry on, you know, their work at Arsenal Football Club? And that's the responsibility I take. And that's what I take now to the academy and want to make I want to make the people proud that they never regret of giving me that kind of opportunity to make a positive influence and difference in an environment which is heavily linked, obviously, to be successful, to bring players to the first team. However, I see to make better people, we ultimately will have better players. So within making better people, making them better educated, you will even influence the 1% to make them better players. So that's kind of the the vision and idea um, I brought to the table. That, 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 that's fascinating. You, you, you mentioned a few names and, and it, it would be a mission not to ask, you know, from this vast you know, amount of people that you've met, who you know, and and I'm, I I like to answer that in two different ways. You know, I, so who of those you see as role models from and why from those that we know, right? You know, but I'm also interested. Are there these hidden people that we know nothing about? You know, we, we where where we we just see the surface. You know, and 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 you know, there's actually people who are enormously influential, and you know, but we, we, it's, they are not public figures. So, do do you have some of those as well? So, the really public ones, where you say, "This is what I learned from that person," but also you started also with your family, and and and. But there are other people that we don't know, but are enormously influential and have an Im- lasting impression. Yeah, um, I, I can I can only agree with that. I've never heard a question like this, or you know, because. Most of the time, you just speak about the people who are in public, you know, and and very little you speak about, yeah, the, the family, friends that keep you grounded, you know, that keep you, you know, that keep you the person you are to be then the person you 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 are in, in society and on the outside world. So, yeah, influential people like obviously parents, friends, grandparents, you know, what I've learned from grandparents and their wisdom and um, is is invaluable. 
you know, I, I would say. So, and these people, they, 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 they don't want to be in the spotlight, right? My, my, they never wanted to be in the spotlight, but they always followed me in my path and would write down all the results from, from the youth ranks and would, would guide me with, calmness with no matter what happens we love you you know that unconditional love you know is is a part that uh, cannot be neglected in all of this here because no matter what you do it is similar to even if you don't be a footballer you know the the, the unconditional love is is really important for all of us moving forward because we cannot let the world of football or to be a star somewhere out there just to be a, a factor in admiring someone, right? So, so I learned so much about this from parents, grandparents, no matter what. If I was injured a year out, couldn't play football, didn't matter, right? I was not judged by these people on the results at the weekend. Sometimes I felt judged by my dad, obviously, you know? They, sometimes they, they get emotional. But then, hopefully, you have more than just one person you can relate to, and they just show you this... What I just spoke about, you know, this unconditional support, you know, that, that is really important for human beings to grow and develop, understand it and give it further and give it to the to the next generation, basically, because we cannot have just uh, an enormous amount of expectation, a burden having on on our next generation or on our kids. That is that is not the right thing. So, um, yeah, I was blessed um, in that sense. And if you look at those that we more publicly know, who, who do you think, you know, and, and like I said earlier, we, you know, I think, you know, people, you know, take very different things, you know, from the role modeling could be, po you know, positive or negative, could be very small things, you know, which are super prominent people. We just take a little bit because that really matters. So so if you look at, and you know, it, you know, one or two people with that, that's really something that I took away from one of those grades that you've worked with. Wow. Um, yeah, obviously, I, I think I described it as, yeah, you want to find your own way, you know, mm -hmm. you are heavily influenced, you know, by those figures that, you know, my, I had great coaches alongside me. And for a longer time, I was influenced heavily by youth coaches, obviously, in Hanover, that in Bremen, I had Thomas Schaaf for five years, he was my only coach there, really. So, um, and I love as a player, you love consistency, you know, that means kind of that, You have been kind of successful, so the club didn't sack. In at Arsenal, similar as Wenger, seven years with me, you know. So he was my only coach here, and with the national team of Germany, Joachim Löw was constantly over that whole time with me. So I had these three influential people alongside me, very very consistent. And um, yeah, what what I've learned from that time. Totally different individuals that bring their own style and own energy and own calmness, emotions. But you kind of guide yourself through that. I, I was blessed to have these people around me. You guide yourself through these people and, and their strengths, weaknesses, everything you see, you kind of take bits and pieces, take the the really, really calmness, you know, from Arsene Wenger, like being the rock for everyone, just protecting that environment and bubble, no matter what happens on the pitch, he would stand up, you know, and protect the players and make sure that you work. But if you work and play hard, you got protected no matter what, you know. That was something I took away from him. Thomas Schaaf was such an influential leader in Bremen where, yeah, he would put me on the spot. He would highlight things where he wasn't happy with my discipline, how I would how I would really, you know, turn up for training and not recognizing if I was injured or ill. He would highlight that, you know, you have to respect me and what I what I do in preparing the session. If I don't know if you have something, you disrespect me in a way. If you just turn up and say 10 o'clock, uh, when 11 o'clock is the training session, I'm injured or, I'm, or my throat is sore. No, I want you to call me. And it's the night before you call me or in the morning at seven o'clock. I need your phone call. I need to know. So, you know, little things. Joachim Löw, how he influenced me on the pitch, you know, with his greatness to teach me how a back four would work, you know, how to cover, how to man mark and, and really recognize situations and how to be better 
as a unit and not so much focus on the opposition. So, you know, these little things, you know, leaders do, they, they, they influence you in a way positively and you find your way, right? You, you find your way, you take something on board and, 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 and you do it because when you're in Thomas Schaaf's bubble, you need to notify him by seven o'clock. Okay, I'm going to do this. You know, that's important to him. Uh, he, he explained it. I'm going to do it. So things like that are used not to nowadays explain to, to the players. I have these examples now where mm -hmm. rightly so it is about respecting one another, not letting people down, not re respecting preparation time, respecting resources, respecting time that has been put into, you know, youngsters. People should understand what kind of goes on in an academy world, what goes on before a training session will be going on, especially now in the COVID world where so much things need to be done, need to be organized in beforehand. Sometimes people don't realize, players don't realize what actually goes on, the groundsmen, um, the facility guys, the kit men, um, the maintenance, the coaches, the SNC guys, psychologists, analysts, a lot of work goes on, you know, and it's kind of, if we have a better understanding for each other, for one another, we're in a better place and we will have a better world, basically. You, you, that, 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 that's fascinating. You, you said you, 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 you want to, you know, make, create, shape your own way, which is it's great. You know, I think that's, you know, that, that I like that, you know, because, uh, you know, we pick and choose what works and try and experiment. It works and it doesn't work. You know, so I always say hindsight is a is a great idea, right? Um, so, so when uh, when did you have situations where you thought in hindsight, you know, later on, that you really got it wrong, right? You know, you really, you know, nice bloody nose in terms of that's, you know, how I thought I set this up in the academy or when you were a more influential player and you turn around e even after second or years and think. God, you know, I, I, that's not really what should have happened, you know. And what did you take away from that? Yeah, I mean, there are many, many situations. You know what? They don't need to be too drastic. You know? Yeah, but, but the good thing is about, you know, um, we learn from mistakes and most from our own mistakes. But the better we understand that we, we will make mistakes and we can learn from those and we can apologize as well, right? So there's a power of uh, many, many things where, yeah, I um, yeah I got it wrong sometimes, even in training um, when, you know, there was a, a, a duel, a tackle um, and someone got down. And we, at Arsenal, for example, we had French players, English players, Spanish players, German players. And then... <laughs> If so, I, I, I was thinking I didn't foul someone and he thought I fouled him heavily. I don't know. And he was raving on in French. And I thought he was abusing me, basically, right? <laughs> so I went to him and said, listen, <clears throat> you need to be very quiet. This is, ve this is very polite in a polite way I say it now. But, I, you know, I was very emotional. And actually, it kicked completely off. And... Uh, Afterwards, obviously, he took, you know, I took it personally, he took it personally, and I kind of, in a way, misunderstood, right, what he was saying on the on the ground. But because I, my French isn't particular that well, um, he actually was just swearing along and not at me. So, yeah, in that moment, and when I when I basically, you know, shouted at him and kind of, in a way, um, said some words that I regretted, you know. Um, and it took, sometimes it takes a couple of days because after the session, you kind of, even in the dressing room, we went on and um, it wasn't good. So to come to a realization that, you know, to apologize and look back and yeah, that is as well leadership skills, right? You know, because as a leader, you get it wrong sometimes, you know, and that is for me as well, you know, to kind of, you want to, as a leader, you want to have a positive influence, but sometimes the emotions crash out of you. And you say something that you regret, but the strength of someone to show weakness in a way that you can, that you have to apologize and, and you know, kind of and regret and make sure that, you know, you stand up for that situation. So, yeah, I, 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 I got it wrong. But the good thing about leaders, you have that bad conscience that comes out then, you know. 
really good and, and influential leaders, they have this sense of, okay, I got it wrong. I need to stand up. I need to put my hand up and say, listen, I got it wrong. Um, it will never happen again. And I will learn from it. That is a powerful thing. You know, that's the powerful piece here I have used. Uh, I, and I needed to learn it. I needed to learn that that um, for sure. So, but to hold your hand up is really important. To look in the mirror is really important. Uh, for a leader because yeah even when you know being an academy manager you know the difficult situation i've never faced where you let people go you let players go you let people go and you could be wrong you could use the wrong word or the words could be perceived in a wrong way where later on you need to then you will find out i, I always find out by myself that's a good thing where i feel like mm, that wasn't right here. You know, you need to be in a position now to really make sure that person that you maybe hurt, you know, gets another word or gets an apology. So that is something, you know, sometimes you get in positions and situations you haven't been prepared for. So, and sometimes you swim and you do really well. And that happens to me 90% of the times when I got thrown into um, my first game at professional level i did really well all of a sudden 10 journalists around me i've never been in that situation right either you sink or swim and where yeah i just represented myself i was humble i didn't overboard i was just myself i'd never had media training before but i thought i, did, I said the right things because the way i was brought up so there are situations where i look back i was never prepared but i but I, but I rose, you know, I rose to this occasion this time. Um, so yeah, there are many different examples. I got it horribly, horribly wrong a couple of times. The, the powerful thing is stand up for it um, and apologize if you have to. Yeah. And in, um, it, it, I like to, you know, take the, this conversation a bit, bit further, right? You know, and. And I know from, you know, um, reading a bit around that you have a broader interest beyond football. And um, and for us, that's, you know, why we're a business school, you know, as, you know, where, you know, it's located. But, but we notice that, you know, that there's, you know, there's a lot of discussion in sport and beyond sport. There is social issues, global issues, but also local community issues, you know, including the sport. And... And so my question is, you know, and, and COVID-19 has brought some of those, you know, even more to the fore, right? Most of them existed, but we just, we, the, the carpet is gone, you know, I always say, um, and in various ways, at the very localized level, you know, uh, but also in the global scale. And and so I'm, I'm just interested, what, you know, what of these issues do play a role for you? Are you interested? Is that important to you? You know, for you and your sport overall. So, what's what's the role of that? And and society views and and local and and more broadly. Yeah, I think you know, <clears throat> I came early to the realization. You know, 15 years ago. You know, to 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 kind of found uh, to have my foundation in place. You know, at that at that time, I wasn't kind of not quite sure what it meant, but I was. I was quite clear that footballers had some form of power, you know, in a sense that people would follow, fans would follow. And quite early I understood, yeah, that's a huge responsibility, you know. You can have such a positive effect. You can have a negative effect as well, you know. So kind of that feeling of, yeah, I want to use my power and give back to the to the community, especially in Hanover, you know, kind of my foundation took place to... To, to really take part in integration, you know, really take part. And, I, and, and we were kind of very early doors, you know, with integrating kids that don't speak German, that are just put in schools with no really idea how could we get them closer to our society, you know, just not let them on their, on their own. So obviously we, we then said, Let's take our foundation a step forward. Let's build something long term where we take kids from really lower school, age six, seven, for 10 years on, have some groups where we play football, obviously, in the afternoon, but take care of their homework, show them how they cook their own meals, healthy food, uh, have tutors around them, and afterwards play football because we kind of wanted to align 
because that is a vehicle to teach them a lot of things about respect, um, about fair play, but as well communication. In my first session where, where I took part in 2006, where we had this pilot of let's take 20 young kids and kind of long term develop them over 10 years to give them a better chance to be an apprentice in society, basically. Um, the first session, no one would talk. Everyone would come from different countries, you know, into Germany. And, you know, we took a heavy burden as well from the parents that we, we gave them twice a week, these 15 kids a home, you know, to develop themselves, to develop their communication skills, to develop their skills, to keep up at school and, and earn their respect because otherwise they had no chance. So we started the foundation and the project and... 15 years later, we have 100 kids in our projects and are really proud of what we kind of achieved. But from a starting point where I realized as a footballer, you have influence and, and, and make it work for society, um, you know, on our doorsteps, you know. And we have horrible scenarios everywhere, you know. And, um, but on our doorstep, there's, there's so much need that we need to make sure we don't neglect, you know um uh, other people so i got a sense of it very very early and i'm very proud of our work and we still continue to grow and try to make a difference in the region of hanover however as you said there are so many issues out there we know we need to tackle uh, i need to be present i need to make sure i comment on and and be a force you know and that's what's expected from me as a pundit you know on german television you know throughout the euros you know um we had the Hungarians, the, the rainbow campaign and all that stuff. And yes, yeah, it's expected for me to be a role model and to express my feelings, you know, around these topics. We had Black Lives Matter. We have a huge pool here in London, you know, of different backgrounds. Um, so we need to reflect society in our academy as well. You know, I cannot I cannot say enough, you know, how fortunate I am to to, to represent Arsenal Academy. However, I need to put people around me who understand London and the backgrounds. I don't know that. I was brought up um, in, in Hanover and Patterns and really, really, you know, kind of life was kind of easy for me. You know, I was supported. My, my parents would take me to training. There are other cases in London, you know, with different backgrounds. So I need to make sure I have people around me who know that you know, and who can speak and relate to people, parents. So that's another uh, great example of um, how, you know, we as role models, footballers, now academy managers are role models and want to make, you know, the world a better place. But we need to start, you know, in our back garden, in our home, you know, to educate my, I need to educate my kids, you know. But I'm fortunate because they go to school and, and, and see the, the, the diversity there. You know, they, they, they are brought up with it. But we may need to make sure that we, that, that we face all the challenges together and, and not on our own, but make sure we educate so, our kids. So, so you, I would, you know, there seems to be kind of like a to continuum where some sports say sports people shouldn't be involved, right? We have the strong, yeah. you know, and then there's, you know, there, this other, you know, where they say, well, that's not how it works, right? Yeah. And and you know, restaurant, you know, with this huge, you know, emphasis and and the, the so do do we recognize that right that there's a massive debate actually what sports yeah. could play? Is that a fair observation? There, there's a fair observation, you know. Is it sports? Is it politics? Shall we do political comments? You know, all that stuff, you know. But we are all humans. We have an opinion and we have such a great influence. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, footballers have more influence than politicians. You know, they, they are more, they have, they have more, uh, they have more to offer, you know, more to offer. And, and they, the, the people can relate so much more to, to these things. So we need to use that. You know, we cannot just close ourselves off. So that's my opinion, how we should move forward and if we have role models like Marcus Rashford you know we should just applaud him you know for what he's doing for the community how he influences politicians obviously the politicians are not happy because it doesn't come from them right you know the, the good cause that, that, that's what I mean so I'm, I'm, I'm we shouldn't be jealous of one another we should we should integrate you know that's that's a part of, of integration so yeah you know there are always a debate of political statements but we stand for something, you know, we want to stand for something as human beings and we cannot shy away from making comments and, and, and being, 
uh, we cannot just be politically correct, you know, and just yeah. shy away from a comment. That's that's not um, how the next generation now grows up, you know. There is critique, there is questioning. Um, that's why we need to communicate more, you know, basically. We need to over-communicate in these days to make sure that people are updated, people want to be updated and not what not want to be trapped in any situations where they feel neglected or feel not safeguard, well, safeguarded well. So, yeah, well, we need to take care of all that stuff. The, I'd like to explore one more idea where there's an interesting parallel, you know, as an outsider. If you look at, at managers for years, decades, you know, you have to be strong as a manager. That's a given, right? You know, if you give in, you know, burnout is not happening when you're a manager, you know, because then you're not really a manager. Um, and, and now we have... A, more and more open conversation about managers also being overwhelmed, you know, mental health questions yeah. and so on. And and in sport, in football, there seemed to be similar development in terms of, you know, the we just had at the Olympics another case, you know, where, where we don't know from the outside, but it looked like and 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 in your personal network, we we we're familiar that so so do you think there is is there a more growing understanding? I'm not sure in management, by the way, you know, whether there's really growing understanding and acknowledgement or is it just the surface? And, and how's that in sport with the pressures? And you also about yourself, you, you had an interview that kind of exploded at some point. So, so how do you see that? Because the, the well-being question, the mental health question, um, what I say, you know, work and sport is work need to be in itself you know, creating well-being. It's not, it's not outsourced, you know, to when you leave. So yeah. how is how is that coming along? Because it still seemed to seem a bit like a management, a bit early, and we're not really sure yet. So what's your view? Yeah, really interesting topic. And I think, obviously, you know, a lot of us just want to have well-being in our performance, right? That's, yeah. kind, of, that's kind of what we are all striving for you know that's why we call a department in the academy as well-being in performance right we didn't want to we didn't want to you know disconnect the two um you know deliberately because you need to find yourself and no matter what you do you need to feel good about it you know that's the first thing and if you don't obviously your physical health your mental health will suffer um you know, I suffered as well throughout my career, you know, in terms of, you know, the pressure that I felt before the game and, you know, what you go through and kind of, I didn't share it at that time because I felt this is part and parcel of being a footballer and that 60,000 people look at you. Yeah, I, I took that on my chin and, and went on with it and still could perform, right? So there, there is a sense of where you kind of feel... Yeah, there will be pressure, you know, for all of us, you know, everyone is kind of in a position where he feels pressure in different ways, but that's so individual, right? That's why we should listen more to the people and allow people to speak up, you know, for themselves, what they feel good about it, what they don't feel good about it. So I, I would, because the issue we have is, even as a footballer, the outside world just thinks, oh, what a beautiful life, money, fame. It, it can only be the best place in the world, you know? And that is as well said by many, many footballers. But some doesn't feel like that. Some need to vomit before the game because that is something in there that is fine, but we need to just recognize it. Some can't take it. Some say, listen, I'm not ready to perform here. But it, won't, it wouldn't be accepted, you know, by the crowd. Why is someone not performing? If you step on this field, you, are, you need to be fit. But we know a lot of players, they have... They're hurt, they take some tablets, you know, that they kind of, you know, are in, 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 in the zone. So there's a huge discussion, but more and more people say, say things, and people can relate to. And, and even myself, you know, I wasn't in a position to speak about it as much during my career, but I wanted to open up and, and speak about the feelings I had, you know. I still could perform, I still loved it, but the more we talk about it and the more we open up, the more players would open up and see this weakness as a strength, actually, you know, see this weakness as a strength because everyone carries something we don't know, right? And we should always respect that. So, you know, and I will lead with, with that, right? That my weakness 
is a strength of someone else. But th that's how I want to lead because that will then give you well-being and performance, no matter what you do. And if someone says, listen, I can't play football, we should knock him. We should applaud him and say, listen, what a great thing to do. But ultimately, you have five other things optional that you can do because you have developed yourself and just not relied on football. But if you have just one thing, one thing you take care of, and that burden or that bubble bursts, yeah, obviously, that, then, then we struggle. So we need to make sure and take care of, of ourselves, um, that our mental health is right. But first and foremost, that our foundation, you know, we build on our values and everything we do is, is more than just one thing. That, that that's fascinating. We ah, we could talk about that endlessly because I you know like I said there's the, the, these tensions in there is is what managers perceive themselves you know and there's a few examples that have come forward why they work often also later right when they in hindsight because they couldn't and we just hope that that like you say it's built in well-being and performance need to be the same thing right it's a long journey I still guess um, <laughs> be, and and because also some just ignore that right you know for various reasons I uh, you know a couple more questions you know I, I like to ask one more thing about you know um you know gender in particular management is also still a massive theme you know woman in management position yeah. and so on and, and i'm just curious it's great to see in the, in, in england that the the woman champion you know, woman super league and so has, has grown it's interesting it's fascinating um, we were at Wem Wembley two years ago, so Germany, England, you know, 75,000. I mean, great, you know, and the noise was quite different. It's, it's interesting, you know, when you go there. Um, but so where do you see that developing? So we see more in, in the actual sport, but, you know, how about, you know, managers, coaches, you know, how about mm -hmm. senior roles? You know, are we on track? Is there more to be done? You know, what do you want? You know, that, that where do you want to go this, this to go? Yeah. I think interesting in England. I, I see in the women's football in particular a lot of investment, even in our club. That there was a real, even recently, a real review, you know, on the resources. Let's say the men's have in football, the academy have, but the women's have. And there was, you know, it was clearly seen that that we need to do more, you know, in in that sense because there's a there's a growing market and the women just keep up, you know, with their performances, with their professionalism. So there is more growth to come, you know, in in terms of spectators as well. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we go into the 10,000s, you know, fairly soon in the next couple of weeks for uh, for attendance and exposure to um, to the broadcasters, you know, and uh, will be will be heavy, you know, not necessarily seen in, in terms of what what Arsenal Football Club will get back in the near future, but there's something to be seen and something to be grown in the next couple of years. In terms of yeah, managerial positions in the men's in the men's game, obviously there's a lack of you know opportunities at the moment. You know, it's not something that has been um, developed over the last five to ten years. Um, but I think there's more to come. I think the integration process is intact and is something that takes place. So, um, but you need to give it time. I can only say this because uh, at the moment um, I wouldn't see that a club like Arsenal Football Club would replace me with the women. I don't see this at the moment in time because we probably, um, yeah, don't have the the profiles in place somewhere. But there are very interesting coaches on the women's side of things. And you hear more about, you see more about it. Um, so the integration takes place. More to be done, obviously. And uh, I hope that Arsenal Football Club will take a role in this, you know, um, yeah. moving forward. And, and you can already see also management position in the club. Some examples coming up in some other London clubs, you know, where actually some of the directors of sport and so on are involved. Yeah. And that's nice yeah. to see, which is... Then another level because that kind of then has trickled down effects. So that, that interesting. So final two questions. You have to talk about that, right? Both of us German background, you know. So what, what is what? Is, where's the German football headed? You yeah. know, and and so you you also make the comment, you know, in your book, which I just found fascinating. You know, after after the final 2014, if you wouldn't have won, you know, this old leader question would come have come up. That I was bored to death with all the time when you open the papers and say, "Oh, we need a leader, 
on the on the, in the team. You know, we don't have enough and all that. Uh, but overall, so where do you, 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 I always try to explain British, you know, English people about German football and their enormous expectations. You know, and 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 then, but also disappointed already beforehand. You know, even if it, no game has been played. Um, and, and that's a bizarre way of looking. But where are they going? So what do you think? You know, ne next next uh, era starting. Yeah, I think I've, we have seen a, a great era uh, with Joachim Löw that has been um, unfortunately been not so successful the last two um, two tournaments. Obviously, before that, you know, um, we expect semi-finals, right? Because before we have only seen semi-finals, successful tournaments. Uh, Twenty. 14 was the highlight, but to, to go there, it was really semi-finals in 2006, 8, 10, 12, four semi-finals be because we ulti ultimately won it, you know, that was the fifth time in 16, it was the sixth time semi-final, you know, six semi-finals on the bounce, basically, before we got crashed out 18 and obviously got knocked out by England now um, in, in, in 2021. So that shows you we are you know we have we are down right now you know the germans are kind of beaten at the moment um but i think that that is just a natural curve in my opinion you know every single successful you know country that has won a world cup at some stage goes through a tough time because other countries just catch up and the pain that England have over, over years, over, over 50 years or what, whatever the case may be, I think they have come to the conclusion to develop a youth system that has been very successful and to have a squad right now that is at the moment better than the German one. But, you know, never underestimate us in terms of bouncing back from those experiences. So at the moment, we're not in the best shape. That's why Joachim Löw needed to go. And now Hansi Flick is in charge and want to lead the change in a, you know, in a way. For Joachim Lewis, it was difficult, you know, it was difficult to lead the change because ultimately we need change right now in terms of integrating the young generation, trusting the young generation to go into next year's World Cup and then the Euros 2024 in our uh, own country. So these are two huge tournaments for us that we are facing. And I would expect us to go back into a mode of being a tournament team that grows into the tournament because the last two really made us a little bit doubt. But I think there's just a natural cycle of being really, really successful and now um, finding a time really to reinvent ourselves. Yeah, in interesting, interesting. Um, final question, you know, at, at our center. And, and, and uh, so we, we were always interested to learn you know uh, what we should look at. You know we we're called a research center, whatever that means, right? So, but but basically we're curious about things and figuring out. So so if you, if you had a magic wand and could ask could ask us, you know what we should look at, research, find more about yeah. uh, out about, what would that be? Yo, that's an interesting question. Um, I think we had a lot of topics actually today on leadership around leadership. Um, what interests me most in terms of, you know, how do we create, especially in leadership, you know, that, that balance between, you know, when to be really influential in terms of, you know, really nailing it down, being really positive and when to actually, you know, um, step back, you know, and helping others to grow into that because ultimately you have to have someone else in place already, you know, who could replace you, you know, one day. So it is, it is. It's fascinating for me, even if I'm I'm very, very young, I'm building a structure, building people around me who ultimately you need to have the next leader, you know, who could replace you one day. That's interesting to me. And the balance between, you know, um, having the, the, the energy levels, keeping your own energy levels up, you know, because sometimes I struggle with the fact that yeah, I do too much. You know, I work too hard. Who gives me kind of a, a guidance on actually um, you shouldn't work 24-7. <laughs> you shouldn't be available 24-7, you know. Have some tactics ready to be more energized, you know. Um, you know, what about emails, you know, 11 o'clock at night, you know. Sometimes, yeah, if it's around the contract and it needs to be done, there's a deadline, yeah. But how do we keep leaders fresh? you know, and energized, you know, for the 
important job they have. Um, that bothers me every single day. So, um, and yeah, that would be interesting for yeah, me. No, that, See, it's very that's interesting. It's very individual and every, everyone is different, has got different levels of energy. But, you know, when I look at, you know, nutrition, sleep, you know, are there, you know, recommendations, you know, for what should you have, you know, to be top fit, you know, leaders, you need to be top fit. You need to be a role model. You, you cannot only, you know, speak about it. You need to do it by yourself. You know, I tell my, my players, you need to sleep well, but eat well. But on the other hand, you know, so at some sometimes, you know, I just feel like, no, I, I cannot sleep because my head is spinning and uh, I eat not the best things because it's just convenient, right? So these yeah. are the topics. Yeah, no, two interesting areas, you know. I think for us, leadership is about stepping back, you know, okay. making others shine. You know, it, it is actually that balance. You know, I, I think... You know, it's something it, you can only create a legacy if you actually have people who follow, you know, when you go somewhere, right? It's about when do you step aside and let others grow, right? Because otherwise, how can they grow if you overcast everything? And that's a, you know, that's a really, and you need to learn that as well, you know, particularly if you're permanently asked to be in the limelight. So how do I step out? And so you call that a balance. I like this term. And that's, that's what, what is in. And the second one is around, this idea about personal energy, which is a hu huge issue, again, in management, right? You know, we are permanently asked, there's it's culture of performance. And, and so how do you, you step out, right? And, and how do you role model that? That's a fascinating, because if you're in charge, you role model that. If you don't, they do exactly what you do to an extent, right? If they're not grown up enough. And, and so, yeah, that, that's fascinating question to continue. Well, final question, where are you headed? What are your plans for the future? Wow, um, my my my, pl my plans for the future continue to grow um, as the leader of the academy. Continue to understand people better um, within London because that's our our market, and it will only grow with Brexit. Um, and we we cannot um, have talent at years of sixteen now within our academy anymore. So understanding London and the people better, and then yeah. You know, sometimes I think, yeah, I want to grow into a sporting director, you know, at a football club at some stage. But sometimes I feel like, you know, that is more limelight, you know, more attention and more um, and in the academy. I'm slightly under the radar, can do my job, can be present, can make a difference. So and we feel really, really good being in London. So, um, you know, it, and it's not only anymore about me. You know, when I was a player, I decided I go to Bremen, I go to Arsenal, my family needed to go with me. And now the decision is not mine. No matter who calls me from Germany and want me as a sporting director, if my wife says, I don't want to go there, we don't want, we're not going. Sim simple as that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really interesting observation. Um, hiring is today about family decisions, something people have not understood, right? It's, you know, wherever you are in your position, you know, at some point it is, these are systemic decisions. You know, you just, pull out someone and everyone follows blindly. That goes for a while. Sometimes it switches. Uh, and I, I think, you know, when we look at recruitment and hiring, you know, it's something, a learning process where, you know, how do we then approach actually people if, if we want to. Well, thank you very much um, um, for, uh, for for giving us these insights. A real pleasure to, to have the opportunity to speak to you. Um, a huge privilege, I have to say, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and thanks again for making time for us. Um, so, so this was uh, another episode of uh, Handy Center for Leadership uh, Jams, our interview series at the Handy Business School. Um, the guest today was Per Matesacker. If you're more interested, we have other episodes already available on our website. Um, and if, feel free to, to join in and stay tuned for uh, next, you know, next episodes in the future. Thanks again for your time. Thank you so much and, uh, and goodbye.